first thing we do is we choose a piece of steel that is going to be useful, most useful for whatever purpose they have. There's different purposes for, there's different steels for chopping, skinning, um, do you want it stainless, do you want it to rust? Some of your old timers will say, I don't want a knife if it won't rust. What they're asking for is all the carbon. They want the carbon in the steel. Hmm. Okay. And they're not familiar with this new stainless. The new stainless has more carbon than the old carbon tool steels. And you can't get them to believe that. Huh. But uh, just because it, it rusts. So we will take a piece of steel. I generally, I'll start out, take a magic marker, and I'll color it down just to give me a, a solid black coating here. Mm -hmm. We'll take a, our pattern. We'll lay it in here on top of the steel and uh, take my scribe and just scribe the, the pattern onto the piece of steel. Hmm. Huh. Once we have our pattern that we've chosen scribed into the steel, all right. Uh -huh. We'll make sure this is exactly what we want. So we'll take it over to the bandsaw, and all we're going to do is just cut off the excess to get get rid of what we don't need. done is just basically cut the extra steel off. Mm -hmm. Now I could spend time and listen to this racket. It, it makes a lot of noise and I can cut most every bit of this knife out and uh, I can cut out about 10 blanks on one blade. 10 blanks. 10 blanks. On one blade. Yeah and that's that's about the life of one blade. Wow. If, if I cut it out all the way around the profile. Or we can go back here to a different machine. Mm -hmm. Hold back here. This is a Bader B3 Knife Makers Grinder. It is made just pretty much exclusively for the the knife maker. Hmm. And the way this is made in the front you can take your belts on and off real easy. You can change your belts. This has got a receiver hitch in the front, mm -hmm. and you can loosen these up, and you can change your tooling arms. Oh wow! Real fast. That's cool. Yeah. So it's all it's set up for quick changing. Huh. And just that fast, we're ready to go. Wow. And uh, we'll we'll go over some different arms and stuff in a little while. Different tools and different uh, different wheels that we use throughout the process. So we'll show you that. So now what we're going to do, we're going to take this piece of steel mm -hmm. that we cut out and we're going to start profiling. Huh. And all we're going to do is grind down to these lines. Okay.
we have got it roughed out. It's just a rough shape. Now we're going to go back and we're going to refine all of these little uh, little uh, finger grooves. We've got different size wheels for making the finger grooves. We're going to we're going to use the inch and a half, and I've got anywhere they I got them that range from a half inch to oh. three quarter to a three inch wheel. Uh, I've got them up there in the cabinet, a, a quarter of an inch, one and a quarter, one inch, any size basically that somebody can draw out or want, we can make one. Cool. So, all we're going to do is turn it into a real nice group. Yeah, you clean can see up it just right out. Yep. Okay. Slant that forward just a little bit so it's not so steep. Nice. So we've got a nice smooth yeah. transition. It's nice. Now we're going to get out all of the all of the grooves that go around this way. So we're going to ease on around this way. Just working the, the finger grooves down. So now, We've got all of our finger grooves. And I've got large hands, so it doesn't fit my hand with that glove on there. Mm -hmm. And some people put this in, some people don't. Uh, this particular pattern has it. There's no reason other than if somebody is doing some fine work and they want to choke up on it just a little huh. bit, it just gives them somewhere to rest. If that groove was not there, it would be straight and I could run the cutting edge on back a little bit further. Right. This top up here is a thumb ramp, and it gives you a little bit of a, a lock. It locks it in your hand. It keeps your fingers from sliding up and getting up on the blade. All right, so we got that. Now, let's go over and get ready to hollow it back. All right. Because I'm going to color this cutting edge right here. We're going to black it out. And the purpose for that, we're going to take it over and we're going to scribe two lines onto the cutting edge and it's going to reveal the center of the cutting edge uh -huh. so that when I go grind it, my edge is exactly in the middle. It's not off to one side. Hmm. So let's look at that. So we're going to lay in here and there's a little carbide center scribe in here. Just going to make sure we get it good scribe line. And what we're going to do is we're going to grind from each side down to this line. And we're going to leave that center thickness as it is because we want plenty of meat to work with when we come back after you do the heat treat and you want plenty to clean up. Now this is pretty much about as far as we want to take it before we heat treat. And we're going to chamfer these two holes. Just just knock the burrs off of it. Huh. It's 
modern stainless steels, I like to use Turco. Huh. This is a, uh, a coating. It goes on the blade and it coats and it dries. And when you put it into the heat treating oven and it heats it up to a, a certain temperature, what happens is all the, the, the carbon deposits and so on will, will come to the surface and sit on the top. This coating allows for easy removal. Uh, also, it flashes off in the oven and when it flashes off in the oven, it gives you somewhat of an atmosphere control. It, it, it burns the oxygen out of the oven. Huh. All right, so. has to come out kind of slow so that it pulls everything in back into the pot. How many knives would you go through, uh, we'll go through a gallon? Well, this particular gallon I've been using since 414. Uh, right here on the edge. And we're just gonna let that drip dry. Now, I always let this dry overnight. Right. And uh, it seems to do better in the oven when it's dry. Mm-hmm. That's the knife we just done. This is one that I worked on before. Okay. And this is, this is what it looks like when it's dry. And this coating will flash off and go away after it's uh, been through the heat treating oven. So this is another one that's ready and it's dry. Okay. <clears throat> now, this one's dried. I like to let the turco dry overnight. Got two different heat treating ovens. Now what I do, I use this one for the high temperature heat. It heats up to 1925 degrees. And when it's that hot, it's a sherbet orange hot. Really? Oh yeah. So what I do is put the knife in, make sure that it sets perfectly straight up. And I don't normally heat treat one knife. I'll do eight, 10 at a time. Uh -huh. um, put the knives in, close the door, turn it on, and I leave the knives in there as it heats up. So it's, it's bringing the temperature of the knives up. They don't get a shock from being out here in 60 degree air and then being put into an oven. Huh. So what happens is as that heats up, when it reaches somewhere in the 1200 degree mark, the temperature of the steel is, is it heats up with the oven. So it's bringing it up nice and slow. Uh -huh it will reach that point and at that magical point there it flashes off this coating on the on the knife huh okay and when it flashes off it's going to basically in a nutshell it's going to burn the oxygen out of the oven and create a somewhat of a an atmosphere controlled or a controlled atmosphere huh. burns the oxygen out so that it doesn't catch on fire and can't burn up anything now it heats it up to like I said, 1925 degrees. After it sits there for about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the thickness of steel. Open it up, take the pliers, I pull them out, and I'll stack them on these cold aluminum plates and lay one on the top of it. It's called quenching. What that does is it jerks the temperature out very fast. Mm -hmm. And when it cools it, the quicker it cools it, the harder. It makes the metal hard. So that's where you get the hardness on the metal. Huh. Now, after it cools off and it's cooled to the touch, I immediately put it in my other oven. Now we're gonna temper. Same oven, same, does the same thing. We're gonna draw the knife. It's called drawing. Hmm. So we're gonna temper it at about 400 degrees for two hours. And it'll cool off to room temperature and then it'll cut on and do it again. So this, this process takes a whole day. Wow. And uses a lot of electricity when it's I when bet. it's running. So that's why we do eight or ten knives at a time. So after the heat treating process they come out with this black charcoal coating on them. Mm -hmm. Now I've already cleaned this off and normally I would surface the whole blade. Sometimes people like this rough texture. It gives us that old worn look. Mm -hmm. So that particular blade I left the surface on the metal just as it is did not surface it so this is going to come out the one with the blade we just done is going to come out looking like this on the surface
Huh. This is what the hollow grind looks like after it's been heat treated. All the the big grind lines, the uh -huh. dark coating. So all of these knives right here have been uh, heat treated. Now you can see I've done surfaced uh -huh. these. So these right here are clean and these are ready to start going back through the grinds to start cleaning up these grind lines. Huh. Now as I work these down I keep going through these sander belts. So I'll go back whatever belt grit that I left off mm -hmm. I'll go back to that grit and start after it comes out of the heat treating oven and that's why you want to leave plenty of meat on there because you're going to remove a lot of it. All right. Now these are already heat treated. This rough finish will stay here on the top where we did not grind it on both sides. It's the same way. And that grind line will clean up uh -huh. like this. And this is the way I do, I sell most of my knives with a satin finish. Huh. I only mirror polish. I don't like to mirror polish. Uh, it's very dangerous. Really? Yes. Now, why yeah. is mirror polish dangerous? I'll show you the grinder in a minute. Oh, look now, at that. Yeah, these have been mirror polished. Wow. And that's some fuzz on there. This, this comes off. That is. But that's the mirror polish. Huh. And this is a uh, Loveless Classic. These all have file work that I actually take a, a hand file and hand file every one of these marks on the top of the blade. Wow. It takes about... 15 minutes to do. It's not too awfully time consuming. Huh. This is this is some of the micartas or the man-made materials. Um, you can get about any color. I mean there is really any color that you want to put. Brown, tans, blues, purple. Huh. This is this is cactus guts. So the inside of a cactus. Literally pulled out of a cactus, suspended, and the colored resin is pumped in around it. And when it sets up it hardens and it gives you the different color with the, the cactus guts huh. inside. That's wild. Pretty neat, isn't it? Yeah. Huh. Wow. This is this is a pine cone. Really? Yep. Just a pine cone that <laughs> fell off of a tree, pick it up, suspend it in a cup, pour this acrylic resin around it. First, the pine cone's been stabilized with a clear epoxy. Mm -hmm. It's been pumped and vacuumed, been put in a vacuum and pulled to a, to a uh, 30, 30 pounds, of 29, 30 pounds of, of uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. And it pulls the epoxy all into the pine cone. So after that it's uh, been stabilized, then you suspend it in a cup, uh, normally a, a little Dixie cup, and uh, the little shape of a Dixie cup there. Uh, this, these are the, this would be the outer uh, edges of the pine cone. I got you. Your center cut is your most desirable. That's pretty wild. And uh, you can split these, and you can get one nice set of handles, and then a, another set up here that's doesn't have all of the, the center in it. It has more more broken up. Huh. But you can get that in different colors. I like the pearl white and the That's pretty slick. Before down there showed you this is coconut husk. That <laughs> this is just literally has this coconut husk that's been mixed in epoxy and poured into a tray and dried. That is wild. Now in a few minutes when we get to that point I'll show you the knife that I just finished. Really? Out of the coconut husk handle. All right, this is all kind of woods. All of these pieces of wood have been dyed and stabilized. And I don't, uh, I don't use a lot of wood unless it's a really nice knife. Hmm. Um, for something that's gonna be thrown in a backpack, it's gonna ride in a truck. Yeah, it's pretty and it's durable, but it's not as durable as my Carta. Something like that would serve better. A pretty knife you're gonna put up for display or you know one that you're really going to take care of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say put some real pretty wood. And there's all kind of pieces of wood. Wow, what is that? It is a looks like a curly white oak. Huh. 
Now, all of these have been dyed and stabilized. And uh, this one's spalted, probably spalted pecan, maybe sycamore. Huh. But uh, this, these, these handles in here, they run in the neighborhood of, uh, they'll start out at $40 a block and go up. So uh, cut the handle materials to fit. And I always grind and finish the front before a uh, buffet, before you put them on the knife. They're very hard to do. When you get them put on there, you can't grind them and clean them up. Hmm. So that part has to be done first. Now what I do is I lay my handles up here, I'll mark it and clamp it, and I'll drill the holes. Then I flip it over, do the other piece the same way. Then I'll clamp the two pieces together and clean the holes out. Now, this particular knife has got two tubular rivets that's holding the handle on. Huh. And drill the quarter inch hole, drop the piece of stainless steel tubing through there that's cut to the right length. Huh. And I've got a machine back here. We'll go show you that now. Huh. Little arbor press that we've drilled and dropped these little fittings in here. So I would bring this knife back here, set the tubing, center the knife up, and when you pull this handle around, it has one on the top, and then you you set the handle very hard. Huh. And it flares out the tubing on the top and the bottom at the same time. Huh. And that's the way both of them are on with or pinned with. So after we get a knife to this point, mm -hmm. we'll decide what kind of sheath we're gonna have. Huh. Get the candy out of the way. All right, here's the knife I told you a while ago. This is the one with the burlap. I mean, excuse me, with the uh, Co coconut husk. That's pretty cool. So it's it, camoed. Yeah. And we have to put the orange liner on there. So if you drop it, exactly. at least you can find it. And contrast. I, I like contrast. Yeah. So this knife would sit something like this in the sheath. This is your your belt loop. Mm -hmm. Doesn't want to cooperate here. This is your belt loop. This would be your right hand. So you have your belt loop. You want to be sure to sew that and glue it before you fold this over and sew it. Makes it difficult. And, and this is kind of what we would look like. Huh. These knives are just these are just simple patterns. Uh, this is not the knife for this one, but I would normally make this sheath come way on up here. Mm -hmm. This this it holds it very tight, mm -hmm. and you see the discoloration. The right. way that I the way that I treat my sheaths after it's done, I use water. I spray water on it to stamp uh, my name. Mm -hmm. To bend the leather, I would wet here and let it soak for just a few minutes. Of course, down this front edge, you're going to wet it. Mm -hmm. And that allows the leather to bend without breaking and cracking. Hmm. So we get it made, formed. We sew it. Got a machine over here to do the sewing. After we sew it, we'll go back and grind these edges and clean them up. And I put it in a food dehydrator for about four hours. You a dehydrator. A food dehydrator. Yep, you have got to get the water out of this sheath before I treat it the way that I treat it. So we turn this on and get it hot and it tells me when it's ready and when it's to temperature. This I normally run to about 280 degrees. Hmm. That's why we gotta get all the water out of the sheath. So I take the sheath out of the food dehydrator and. Stick it in here for about eight to 10 seconds. Hold it in, drain it out, set it in the little basket. And what that does is it, the sheath is hot. The sheath is about 150 degrees and it, it allows this mixture to be absorbed right into the sheath through and nearly through and through. It is, it sucks it in and it makes it waterproof. Ah. Okay, and it's gonna stiffen up the leather so after the sheath has dripped dry and we wipe it down, clean it up, this is this is one of my sheaths and this is what huh. this is what water does to it. Nothing. That's cool. 
inside inside the sheath, outside, down in the threads. Every part of that right there has been treated. That is that, cool. That's a that's a 20 year sheath. Wow. That's pretty cool. Any color that you can make a tan, blue, green. These are just some scraps. Yeah. Um, pink. I uh, gotta have a sheet of pink every now and then. Some of the ladies. And I'm. I do a lot of uh, military police, tactical stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, this little rod has a diamond in the end of it. And when I finish a knife, I bring it in here, lay it up here. This box contains all of my tools for calibrating this machine. I can put the blade in here, turn it down to a certain pressure, flip the lever, in a matter of 30 seconds it tells me what the Rockwell hardness on the C scale is. Huh. So I know if my heat treat is right. Wow.